Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, my guest is Ryan Hawks, mental skills trainer at GameSync Training. Our topic is GameSync Training, the mental game. All right, welcome, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Great to be here. All right, so what is GameSync Training? Oh, good question. Yeah, so game sync training is basically like a like an esports based uh, mental skills training platform where we just help people to work on the mental side of the game. An easy way that I like to say what I do is it is like personal trainer, but for your mind. Okay. So, what is your background that allows you to do that? Yeah. Uh, so, I did my master's degree in sports psychology. Uh, so I like to say sport and performance psychology because it really goes beyond sports. And uh, I recently got, got that completed from John F. Kennedy University. Well, kind of recently now. But um, yeah, so I, I did that, all kinds of courses in performance and sports psychology around all kinds of different topics like choking under pressure or uh, performance anxiety, even just goal setting and breathing. You know, choking under pressure, that's a really big deal for athletes. What, how do you work with an athlete to help them deal with choking and um, that pressure that they have uh, when they're doing well and, and the game's really close? Yeah, that's like, it's probably like one of, if not the most common thing that I work with, with um, esports athletes. It's usually they're choking under pressure. And the thing about it, though, it's not a straightforward answer. So we really have to, before we work on that choking, we have to back up a little bit. The first thing we do is work on awareness building. It's usually where I start with almost anyone, becoming more aware of your surroundings and then aware of yourself. And how are your surroundings and your thoughts and feelings and behaviors affecting your performance? And then from there, we can start to get to the roots of some of what can cause that choking. You know, what was it? I was thinking about choking actually a couple days ago when I was watching the LPGA um, uh, US Open. Okay. Yeah. And the commentator kept saying about the leader um, who is actually from Hawaii, um, she kept saying, now she has to focus on the present. She has to forget the past and forget the future. Is yeah. that one of the skills that you work with, um, on, you know, in terms of? the issue of choking and performance anxiety? Yes, that's exactly it. That's really a lot of it. In a lot of the early um, sports psychology research was done in golf. Uh, golf is one of the easier ones to study as an individual sport. Um, and yeah, it is about being present. Those that, the opposite of choking, we call it being clutch, right? Those that are considered clutch are people that are able to stay in the current moment usually, and just perform. They're not thinking about the past, how di even if they were doing well, how well they were doing in the past, even five minutes ago, how bad they did, how much it sucks that they you know, missed that hole. And they're not thinking about the future either. They're not thinking about winning or losing. They're just thinking about performing. Yeah, so um, would you say that a, a better player is going to be someone who is able to deal with that pressure? Yeah, they, you have to. You have to be able to deal with that pressure and not let it overcome you. Because the, another thing that comes down to it is attentional capacity. And our attention has limited capacity. And we, when we're doing peak performance, when it comes down to it, then all of that has to go towards whatever the performance is, whether it's golf or gaming, you know, getting that headshot or whatever that may be. So if you're able to stay in the moment, if you're able to stay focused and put all of that attention towards it, we're going to be a lot better off. So for game sync training, when, um, who are you working with? Um, like, is it teams? Is it, is it individuals or like what age range ranges are you working with? Yeah. I mean, simply put, we're worldwide, worldwide service that works with everybody. Um, there isn't, there isn't like a huge um, demographic right now that's really honed in on. I've worked with people as young as like seven, uh, oldest, 
probably at this point, oh, maybe their 40s, I, I don't know, um, but all kinds of ranges, yeah, all ranges, all uh, levels of professionalism, you know, whether they're just an amateur or whether they're trying to be pro. And sometimes they're just gamers who are also, I work with streamers and they may not even want to go pro, they just want to be streaming so they want to get good. Um, so individuals as well as teams too. So uh, we've recently honed in a little bit more on teams than, than in the past, but uh, yeah, we also work with teams. When you're talking about gaming, what percentage of the play would be mental versus um, skills based in terms of physical? Yeah, that's like the million dollar question even beyond gaming. Uh, a lot of experts say in traditional sports, that it's up to 90%. Now, these are sports like 90, where you have 90%, to be 90% mental. mental. Yeah, oh, 90 okay. mental. Yeah, now in esports hasn't been cl as closely studied because we're not quite there yet, but I would have to think that if it's about 90% in a traditional sport, like soccer or baseball and football, it's probably as much or more in gaming where there's even less emphasis on those physical skills and a lot more on the mental. Sure. So if someone is having a really bad day, it might translate into their performance, right? Yes, 100%. Yeah, and that's why when we're thinking about it and I'm talking to them about building their awareness, right? And like, what, what, what happened before, during, and after the performance? Like, what was your day like? What did you eat before you even played? You know, it affects you. Do you find that um, athletes will rely on like some lucky thing, like I'm wearing my lucky shirt or, you know, they have to have something that a certain way in order to have that mental uh, ability? Yeah, that's that's funny. You know, I've seen it a little bit less in gaming than traditional sports. You know, we, we've seen it a lot. Baseball, they're super superstitious uh, a lot. I haven't seen it as much in gaming. Um, I can't think of any good examples of that, but I'm sure, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. Like, okay. So let's talk about team dynamics. If, uh, have you worked with teams? Yeah, I've worked with a couple teams. So when you work with a team, um, do you have to observe how they work together first before you, uh, get involved? Tell us how that works. Yeah, that's a good question. It, a lot of the initial stuff with teams is, is observations. Um, you can kind of do simultaneous. Uh, what I like to do is both the teamwork and some one-on-one -on -one at, the, at the same time. You, know, you spend some time observing the team. You spend some time with the teammates one-on-one. -on -one. But yeah, a lot of it is observation. And it's especially fun to observe because then you get to see some of the, the discrepancies that some of the individuals bring in regarding their observation, their, their observations of themselves or their own awareness. So it is really important to do that observation. So is insight um, an important aspect of um, peak performance mentally? Yeah, insight, you have to be, have insight on them yourself, your strengths and weaknesses. You have to be open to learning more about it. Um, and then you have to have insight on what your role is on the team. Sometimes someone wants this role or they may think that they have the role of being maybe the leader or something, but they're not. <laughs> they need to know what their role on the team is. So I would think an ex extremely important element of teamwork and gaming is uh, communication. Let, uh, tell us about the communication piece and how that relates to mental training. Yeah, communication and, and that's, they, they go hand in hand, especially on teams. And a lot of individuals ask me that are trying to find a team, like I'm really good. And some of them are, I've, I've worked with some people who, if I look at their stats, they're like top 5% in the world, but the teamwork's not there. You know, they, the, and they, and they stream, they might stream. And then they're like, why am I not getting picked up? It's like, well, it doesn't seem like you have that collaboration. It doesn't seem like you have the, the communication, especially with others to help you get on the team. Um, so that's kind of a big thing. How are you able to work with athletes to improve that communication and their ability to collaborate? Yeah, 
I do, yeah. And it's a lot of times we'll have to set some goals down with that. We do some really specific types of goal settings and set what we call process goals that really work on small pieces of the performance. And communication is performing. It's all part of it. So we may, I may have to tell them to um, hold back from speaking five times during your next practice or opposite. They don't communicate enough. I need you to do call outs at least five times so that you can start to communicate. And then the big thing in communication is, is getting gamers call it getting tilted, right? When they just get mad at their opponents or even their teammates, and then the communication goes downhill, which causes a performance decrease and really a spiral of a decrease. How important is listening as communication in, uh, in a team? Yeah, I mean, it's just, just key. I mean, it's all, it's all key because they're a unit. They're a unit, so you have to listen in order to stay as a unit and operate like it's a machine in, in many sense. Each of those teammates is a cog, so they have to listen. You have to listen to each other. They have to be humble, um, especially the higher levels that you go, because they're all really good and they think that they're the best one on the team. But they all have their roles and they all have to fall into those roles. And sometimes it means pulling back and sometimes it means pushing forward. So in business, the the word or the discussion is always about the culture. So would there be a team culture or even a game culture that you would be addressing when you're looking at these issues? Yeah, what, what I try to do with teams, and this is usually like the first work that we're doing, is uh, trying to build a culture of excellence. And one of the ways to do that is obviously you want to get the buy-in in order. Like to me, what does that mean, culture of excellence? I have my ideas, but each team has their own unique idea of what that means, and each member has their idea. So the way that we go about doing that is doing what we call a team creed. So that can take us you know, hours to do. Of and a lot of times when I work with a team, we'll do a one-hour session, uh, you know, at least once a week. So sometimes it takes us three weeks or so to complete this creed, where each of them individually first they write down what what is the best team mean to me? Like what is an excellent team? They think back to the best teams they've played on. They think back to the, their favorite team that they observed. What are some of the traits that that team has individually? And then, depending on the team size, we may kind of split them in half and then or pairs and start working. If they're a smaller team, which is usually how esports goes, you know, five, six people, then we can bring them together. And now they start deciding and we say, okay, you have five, you have five, you have five. Let's come together and choose five together that what is this team what makes this team unique uh, and they start agreeing on it and then you get the buy-in and then they all start working towards really living that culture so in in when people um do traditional sports uh you know there's a, there's a lot of opportunity to learn about being on a team like if you play little league baseball or if you know whatever but in gaming, there's a lot of opportunity to be an individual. Mm -hmm. And so how is it in gaming versus like traditional sports in terms of teaching people those skills that they would learn in traditional sports? Yeah, and that, that's right now where esports is really suffering. And, and that's really a good big part of why I chose to focus in on esports, whereas Traditional sports, people are playing them since they were kids on teams, in team environments with coaches that are helping them to kind of collaborate more, that are helping them to have healthy communication skills and healthy coping skills. Gamers, a lot of them have been playing since they were kids. A lot of them have been playing with people since they were kids, but they're playing in, online with people of all ages. They're playing in baseless places where toxicity is much more common and easier to do. So that's what holds a lot of people back when they're trying to get onto teams is they don't have the communication skills. They don't have the social skills that are needed for collaboration because of, you know, they're individual, individualistic a little bit too much sometimes. 
And with COVID, when people were more isolated, did that, do you think that impacted the mental game? Yeah, yeah, I, I think it did. Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I kind of think about that sometimes. And as we've moved more towards a digital world, in, in some ways, some gamers were already equipped to not be as, as affected, maybe, because many of them already have been playing online with their friends and, and things like that. But definitely worse now. I, I think the effects are maybe more than initially I thought or, or others thought. Uh, yeah, there's there's less social skills. There's less, you know, in-person communication is, is just different because once you put a face to a name, now you become real. And the, that's kind of maybe even emphasizing the problem with COVID is gamers, that if when they're on teams, they don't have a face to that name. And so it lets them be a little bit more toxic sometimes. Sure. So in working with teams, are they physically together or are you online with them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on my end, I've, I've only worked, um, I'm trying to think with GameSync with those teams. I, I've only done online work with the team so far. Um, but they, it, it, it's funny, it, I've worked with some, they may be physically together. I've worked with a few where um, they might just all be in the same room and, you know, just like we're on Zoom now, then I see all, all of them or they're on their own devices. Like I've done it where they're in the same room on the same device, on different devices. And I've done it where they're all at home and, and stuff like that too. So th that is one good thing about gamers is they're, they're flexible, you know, they're flexible, they're used to technology. So the, the barriers that maybe uh, in the past, um, some traditional sports would face in terms of coming together and the ability to do so, gamers are like, this, this is nothing for me. So when we're talking about the mental game and mental training, um, are there times when someone has personality issue or some kind of um, maybe even a psychological diagnosis that would impact their performance? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and that's that's where it becomes kind of knowing what what my lane is. Too, I definitely refer out. I have referrals ready to go that it, it makes it a little bit trickier the fact that I do work internationally um, because sometimes I have to go and do some research I mean I've worked with gamers in like Greece and stuff and um, I don't know if I've done international ones yet but I've definitely done referrals for people in other states and then you know I have to go and ask them what city are you in um, and maybe find a, a therapist uh, if they need that but definitely um, it comes up yeah and there's things that affect them um that that i can see and like okay this this is a little bit beyond my scope um but let me get you someone who may be able to help out in a different way what what are uh some of those issues or diagnoses that might impact their performance yeah um mostly i mean there's depression is one of one of the big ones that i've seen a few times where um, you know, gamers may lack motivation uh, in terms of getting better. You know, there's someone I remember working with. I started out and, you know, he was really motivated, really go-getter. And then he kind of had this period where it just showed those signs, you know, the apathy and losing motivation and, you know, tough for him to get out of bed. And at that point, yeah, and he noticed, like, my, I suck right now. I'm not playing well. And so at that point, I'm like, well, you know, based on what you're telling me in this regard, um, it may help you to do this. I mean, another person, relationship problems. Uh, I referred him to a couples therapist because, you know, at some point we, we I think one of our sessions, um, you know, we weren't even, we didn't even speak about gaming. And I'm like, okay, well, it sounds like there's other stuff going on that you may want to kind of be referred out for. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah, I could I could see where you would have sessions where where a person would be so focused on something besides gaming that they wouldn't that wouldn't even be a big issue. They would be talking about their problems in their lives. Yeah, yeah, and you definitely have to reel them back in and and let them know. I, I mean, many times they want to call me their psychologist or their therapist, and like no. You know, I, and, and it's just to do them justice. You know, we don't want to, I don't want them to, to 
be given bad information. It's not my expertise, but it all the thing is, is it affects it. You know, I can talk about maybe um, lack of motivation from a performance standpoint and try to help you in that regards, but um, beyond performance, it'd be better for you to speak to someone else. So when you come in, is it usually the actual gamer who makes a decision that they need to learn the mental game? Um, or is it maybe a coach or a parent? Um, how is it that you end up um, working with a, a, a player? Yeah, good question too. The majority are self-referrals. Um, I have gotten a few coaches to come in and, and find us and say, hey, you know, I've got a few people that I think could benefit from this. Uh, parents as well are kind of looking for that for their their kids. Um, yeah, it's, and, and it's a lot of, yeah, mostly self-referrals. And the funny thing is some, sometimes they're not even 100% sure on what they're signing up for at first. Uh, mental skills training isn't quite as known in, in esports and quite as accepted. Um, so I really kind of have that initial conversation and and people really get surprised. Oh, okay, you know, they may be looking for a traditional coach that can help them improve their aiming or centering and or you know comboing, and then I'll let them know, like, oh, geez, you know, actually, I do, I do kind of choke under pressure a lot. That is something you could help me with. Let's kind of move forward here. So that's what's fun about it. So, how, what is the process of working with? an athlete like how long how many weeks or how many hours mm -hmm. uh, do you spend yeah that's a that's a good one too it it, it all uh, it all depends on what they want to do traditionally what i what i'd like to do is, is start off um with the, like a five session commitment from them and the sessions happen uh usually once a week for one hour uh, once a week one hour sessions typically consecutively that's going to be the most effective um and usually it's virtual. Yeah, I mean, I've done some in person, but since less happens now, even for the people that are local to me, I've, I've usually done uh, virtual. Um, so that's how that kind of goes traditionally. And we work on one, one mental skill can take between one to three sessions, depending on how deep we go into it. So in, fi in a five week uh, period, we may do two to three. Uh, where we dive in, it, it really starts with a good assessment. You know, that first session is information gathering. What's their history as in gaming? What's, what kind of support systems do they have outside of gaming and interests and identity? What are some of their strengths that they have now? What are some of their um, things that they want to work on? And then we can kind of create a plan from there of how the next four or so sessions would look. And then from there, like, let's do a reevaluation re and see how much longer we want to go. And so what kind of skills do you work with them on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, a, it's all kinds of stuff. But uh, after we go awareness, it may be um, the performance anxiety thing. So in order, it, it always depends on what the root is. So for example, with performance anxiety, it could be um, like a breathing thing and overactivation is a lot of times what happens. So what I'll kind of start with is a breathing exercise and like, okay, when you start to notice that you're getting a little too amped up, sweating, heart beating, uh, things like that, then let's do some breathing to get you back to where you need to be. We may even follow up there with like some thought stopping um, or um, reframing because maybe they're just interpreting these uh, physiological symptoms as negative. Something that I like to tell people, anxiety and excitement, if you really break it down, they have the same physiological symptoms. So why don't we try reinterpreting what you're calling anxiety as excitement because you're excited to perform. That's something that can help a lot. Um, so we're usually like defining the concept um, giving some examples, individualizing it to them, and then kind of creating that plan on how we can proceed. All right. So, do you um, do you think the that any particular game um, makes a difference? I mean, does your work with them, um, uh, you know, does it dictate what game that they're playing, or is it? Or is that, that irrelevant? Yeah, that's irrelevant. That's what that's what always is cool. I tell them like it doesn't matter what game you're playing. You know, you can work with me, uh, and, and that always is something that surprises people. Um, 
Yeah, it doesn't matter. It applies, not only does it apply to gaming, I mean, it applies to life. Those same uh, anxiety uh, assisting strategies work in things like job interviews, taking tests, going on a podcast. All, it, it all works in everyday life. So, you know, this is really a holistic approach. And, you know, in, in many ways, we're just using gaming as a vehicle to help people become better people in their lives, to help them be the best versions of themselves. Sure. Okay, so let's take a look at your website, and why don't you tell us about it and how people can find you and uh, what you offer. Yeah, definitely. So on there, we've got, um, looks like what we have up there is is, is um, the homepage. A lot of times you want to start at the top individual gamers or teams, and then you kind of click on which one represents you, and we've got our services there. So there's all, all kinds of great stuff. I mean, we have this really fleshed out. So scrolling down, you can get some information on what we're doing, what our process is, some of the testing and tools that we're using. You know, this is all evidence-based stuff uh, that we're using in performance psychology, research-based, um, and then some of the things we do. Um, we even do, I mentioned the sessions where we have gameplay view, where I can observe you playing, um, and things like that. Um, controlling the pace, that's some of the ideas that we have. Uh, we even do some assessments like midway point, maybe if we're a month or two in, like where did you rate yourself on certain skills when we started, and where did you rate yourself now? We even have gamer workshops too that um, they are kind of larger workshops where more people can come, a little more generalized, but a little bit easier for some people that aren't ready to take the individual dive. And um, yeah, I mean, that's mostly that. If you were to scroll down further, you'd see some of the packages there. And you can always book a free consultation. That's where we get most of our, our um, referrals in there. Uh, there's a free consultation. You can it, Usually it's going to be with me where you get uh, about 15 minutes to go through a little bit um, of, of what I do what and how it can be specifically worked towards you. All right. Fantastic. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for telling us about um, mental training for esports and gaming. Um, I hope a lot of people contact you. Yeah, I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you all having me here. This was great. All right. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. In two weeks, my guests will be Tony Brown and Justin Manley to discuss Black Point BR, creating a new frontier in gaming and the military community. And so we'll see you then. Thank you so much for watching ThinkTech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo. Thank you so much. Mahalo.